Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Inane Dragon, and tonight we're going to learn all about how to convince an atheist he should become a Muslim. Frankly, all I got out of it was more reasons to be an atheist. So here we have it. Islamic Reminders, Does God Exist? Atheism, Science, and Quran. Roll clip. The Christian, he is a Christian because father is a Christian. The person is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslims because their father is a Muslim. This atheist is thinking his father, his parents may be religious, but he does not believe in the gods which his parents worship. Most of the atheists we realize have become atheists because they believe in science and technology. These people think that science has advanced so much, we don't require any scripture, we don't require any religion, etc. Well, to be fair, I'm kind of an odd man out in the atheist community. Both of my parents had become atheists well before I was born, and they encouraged me to study religion, history, and the arts as much as science. But, enough of my backstory, let's get to your video. The first question I ask to the atheist is, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a machinery, which no one in the world has ever seen before. If it's bought in front of you, if it's bought in front of the atheist, and if we ask the question to him, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this machinery or this object, what can be his reply? Well, since you specified that no one in the world knows about it, then the first person who can tell me anything about it is whomever most efficiently reverse engineers it. And this is a great analogy for science. While the data currently available strongly suggests there is no need for any creator and there is no design, science approaches the natural world a lot like someone hired to reverse engineer something that was designed with a purpose. We study it, we make the minimum possible assumptions about it, and we make the conclusions we can with the data that results. Nothing more, nothing less. Since you say there's no one on Earth familiar with the machine, the last thing I'd do is hunt for someone like a manufacturer, creator, inventor, or producer. So I'm sure you're not going to suggest that's what an atheist would say. The reply the atheist will give you is the first person who will tell you the mechanism is the manufacturer. Some may say the creator. Some may say the inventor. Some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either they say the creator, the manufacturer, the producer, the inventor. It will be somewhat similar. Just keep it at the back of your mind. Damn it, no! I can't think of any atheist worth his salt who would make such a basic fuck up. And it's not even a mistake because it falls into the trap that you think you're setting. It's a mistake because you already said there is no one who knows anything about it when you set up this thought experiment. That means there's no creator to ask. Stop straw manning your straw man. Okay, from here I think we can see where you're going. You're going to make the Quran predicts shit argument for Allah, and I'm going to counter with the fucking moron rebuttal, which takes several forms. First, there's the that's not what that says part of being a moron. Second, there's the that's not what we know to be scientifically true, so you're just wrong aspect. This one is arguably the most devastating for Islam, since if any verse of the infallible Quran is wrong, then technically the whole thing is, and you should deconvert today. But, as a personal challenge, I'm going to go with the most interesting prong of the fucking moron rebuttal. Uh-oh, this did it! Which is to say, I'm going to do my best, and will be keeping score, to counter every claim by pointing out that someone else had offered up the idea before Muhammad. Since the South Park episode stuck with The Simpsons, I'm going to stick with a single culture out of thousands that predate the Quran. Well, let's go with Ancient Greece. Just imagine how many others might have also made these same claims if I can score any points for the Greeks. And we won't count Greek philosophers that lived under Roman rule either. That how did our universe come into existence? So the atheists will tell us that initially there was a primary nebula. Then there was a big bang. There was a secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies, the sun, the moon, and the earth on which we live. Unless this he's ignorant, a big bang. and honestly, it's okay if people are, really. But, unless your atheist is ignorant, he's not going to say the universe started from a nebula. You seem to be mixing stellar formation with big bang cosmology. I've heard the starting point presented as a singularity or as being as close to a scientifically meaningful definition of nothing as you can contemplate. Either way, not a nebula. Sorry, had to clear that up because apologists never seem to actually understand the science and yet pretend they know it better than any specialist in the field. When did you come to know about this creation of the universe? 
So he will tell you, about 30, 40 years back, the scientists that discovered this. You ask him the question, but what you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see, Anna samawati wal arda, ka that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So the atheist will say, maybe it's a fluke. No problem. Don't argue with him. First of all, let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's a blatant paraphrasing of the creation myth from the book of Genesis. So the Jews said it first in that sense. Doesn't count. Doesn't count. I said it has to be the Greeks. Oh, right. Speaking of that, there's this fellow from Greece, Anaxagoras, who wrote several centuries BCE. Want to guess what he had to say somewhere around a thousand years before Muhammad? He described the beginning of the universe thusly. All things were together, infinite both in number and in smallness, for the small too was infinite. His idea of an infinite mind caused this infinite quantity in an infinitely small space to suddenly expand into the whole of the universe. It formed stars and planets orbiting the stars, and life all out of the same material. He even suggested there was no reason not to have life on planets orbiting different stars. Frankly, Anaxagoras' model sounds a lot more like modern cosmology than your particular interpretation of a single Quranic verse. The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So the atheist will tell us that previously we thought the moon has its own light. Recently we have come to know in science, recently means 100 years back, 200 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but a reflected light. The Quran mentioned 400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, Verse number 61, that blessed is he who had placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein a lamp, a sun, having its own light and moon having reflected light or borrowed light. The Arabic word used for moonlight in the Quran is munir or nur, meaning reflected light or borrowed light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon is not its own light but reflected light which we have come to know recently? The atheist may say, your prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, maybe he was an intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Nah, mate. An atheist who is paying attention will point out that eclipses, the phases of the moon, and other phenomena provide a decent basis for establishing that the moon's light is reflected. If we have anyone to blame for thinking the moon is a source of light, it's probably Genesis. That being said, I believe you need to start worshipping the prophet Anaxagoras, because once again he was the first person to put it in writing, at least in Europe, the idea that the moon's light was a reflection from the sun. Again, the Greeks did it! And this was even the same fucking Greek. Your prophet, he's looking more and more like a cheater who copied someone else's exam, buddy. Let's not get ahead of ourselves in the Greco worship, though. Anaxagoras thought the sun was a really hot rock, so at least he didn't predict nuclear fusion. Would have been fucking cool, though. Could have started a cult that would last 1400 years or more with that kind of prescience. The world that we live on, what's the shape of this earth on which we live? The atheist will tell you, it is spherical. When did we come to know? So he will tell us, it was 1597 when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, that he proved that the earth was spherical. No, he'd tell you that. <laughs> or more precisely, the Greek philosopher Aristosthenes used sticks, a well, and basic geometry to not just prove the earth was round, but to accurately calculate the circumference of the globe. And he did it all in the 3rd century BCE. That's 900 years before your Muhammad. The idea of the earth as round isn't a new idea, you realize. The flat earth model is mostly found in old religious texts like the Quran, with its many references to how the earth is spread out, like a carpet or something. But the Quran says 1400 years ago, in Surah Naziat, Chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal arda baada zalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg. It refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the world is not completely round like a ball, but it is geospherical in shape. It is starting from the pole. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Who could have mentioned 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? Again, the atheist may say, you know, your prophet, maybe he's super intelligent. Right. 
here's one where I can't say the Greeks did it, because, drum roll please, you appear to be wrong, and even if you were right, the Quran would then be wrong. See, you appear to be wrong, because everything I can find says that not a single expert in Arabic agrees that the word used here to mean spread out can be interpreted as shaped like the egg of an ostrich. The closest any are willing to come to that claim is to point out that the word may be related to how ostriches prepare the area where they lay their eggs, by spreading out a flat area large enough to squat in over top their egg. For what it's worth, my translation of the Quran does not make any reference to ostrich eggs. Even if you aren't wrong about the Arabic, and I'm not an Arabic scholar, I just offer countervailing claims about that, you have to deal with the simple fact that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. That is, it's squashed around the poles and stretched out around the middle. Ostrich eggs are prolate spheroids, stretched out towards the poles and squashed around the middle. The Earth is not ostrich egg shaped. You'll either want to abandon the interpretation or abandon Islam, since the Quran is either false or infallible, and we just failed it. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun was stationary. It revolved, but did not rotate about its own axis. So they used to say, is that mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, that is what I learned in school. I had learned the sun was stationary, did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it is Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that besides the sun revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheist will be silent. I'm not even sure what you think your school taught you. It's pretty confusing, and you should demand your money back, or go back to school and pay attention this time. I'm not sure you listened properly first go-round. Here's what I can say. The Quran compares the sun to the moon in orbit, which implies a geocentric model, which makes sense. At this point in time, geocentrism was all the rage. Moreover, Islam inherited Judaism's distinctly geocentric model of the universe. However, you want to imply a heliocentric model, or even a modern model where the sun orbits the galactic core. Problem. Samson did it! That's right, the Greek Philolos postulated sometime in the 5th century BCE that the sun orbits some central fire at the heart of the universe, which incidentally is more correct than your Quranic verse. Where he goes sideways is proposing that the Earth doesn't orbit the sun, but this same central fire, without understanding that the Earth orbits the sun, which orbits the galactic core, which orbits the center of the universe, and quite a few Greeks posited heliocentrism, though most discarded the idea of the sun's orbit around some distant core of the universe. Oh, and your Quran only posits a sun that orbits around something, not a sun that spins at the same time. You're overreaching, mate. Today, science tells us that the universe is expanding, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47. Well, it does say, we are expanding it. But does that mean he's adding suburbs to outer planets, adding more stars, or literally expanding the borders of the universe? And fine, I can't find a Greek philosopher who offered this one up. That being said, I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Anaxagoras's lost works. It fits with the other crazy shit he dreamt up. But wait. Thing is, this sounds a lot like the phrase from the Old Testament talking about stretching out the heavens like a tent. And here we have to ask, and I have to leave my comfort zone, does the text actually say expanding? As I've said, I'm not an expert on Arabic, but the translations of scholars Yusuf Ali, Pekthal, and Shakir exclude such an interpretation. This may be a case of picking the translation that suits the story you want to tell, my friend. There are numerous sites that discuss this, and it's worth reading up on your own time. I know I'll continue to look into it. The Quran speaks about the word cycle which we learned in school. It was so Ban and Palissy in 1580 who first described the water cycle, how the water evaporate from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down as rain. This water cycle is spoken about in great detail in the Quran in several verses. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 17. 
in Surah Furqan chapter number 25 verse 48 to 49, in Surah Fatir chapter number 35 verse number 9, in Surah Yasin chapter number 36 verse number 34, in Surah Mul chapter number 67 verse number 30, in Surah Tariq chapter number 86 verse number 11. There are hundreds of verses in the Quran which only speak about the water cycle which science has discovered recently. Uh -oh, did it, did it. To quote Xenophanes, The sea is the source of water and of wind, for without the great sea there would be no wind, nor streams of rivers, nor rainwater from on high. But the great sea is the begetter of clouds, winds, and rivers. Seriously, you should study ancient Greece, O Quran Thumper. That today we have come to know that the plants have got sexes which we did not know earlier. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have got sexes, male and female. So what? Anyone who studies horticulture is going to figure this one out, including, let's say, Empedocles, another Greek. These fuckers studied plants so insanely closely that they understood most of the parts of a plant, how they fucked, the idea that plant semen, also known as pollen, travels the globe to hunt down some plant to fuck. Don't worry, he starts gish galloping soon enough, and it gets harder to even understand what he's trying to claim. So I'm going to have to stop reciting the fact that if it weren't for the loss of information in Christendom, we'd probably have colonies in Alpha Centauri by now. Today, we have come to know that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. And there's a barrier between them, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53, and Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse 17 and 18. It is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they're not mixed. There is a barrier between them. Insects know there's a difference between water they can drink and water they can't. It's practically an insult to the Greeks to search for an example of a Greek scholar saying, Dude, don't drink the water that will fucking kill you. Drink the fresh water from a spring or river instead. Are you fucking kidding me? Also, the Quran is factually wrong on this one. The waters mix thoroughly where they meet. It's not a barrier between them, bucko, but a mixing of fresh and salt water that we call brackish. Are y'all really going to make me look this shit up? Fine. But in that case, I'm going to stoop to pointing out by noting that amongst their repertoire of mystical creatures are naiads, spirits of fresh waters, and oceanids, spirits of salt waters. Back to the point about brackish water. Since this is a region where sweet and salty waters meet, mix, and commingle, not only are there species of plants and animals dedicated to living in these zones, but to migrating between brackish and salty, or brackish and sweet, waters. Your Quran is just wrong. And as the infallible, inerrant word of Allah, that means he's wrong. So going to become an atheist now that your own claims have falsified Muhammad and Allah once again? No, didn't think so. You only care about facts when you think they agree with your book. Today science tells us that it is the mountains which prevent the earth from shaking, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7. No, my friend, science tells us that you don't know Jack. Mountains do not hold the earth in place, our current theory of geology and plate tectonics says something completely different. Just to be clear, I know people. One of those people happens to be a geologist. Now, this is purely anecdotal, but when I asked him about this claim, he pretty much kicked a puppy. His exact words, when asked, mountains don't prevent earthquakes, do they, were as follows. Like alcohol prevents bad decisions? Sorry, I can't count this one in your favor, buddy, because mountains can be formed by earthquakes, but they can't prevent them. Earthquakes happen along fault lines in the Earth's crust, regardless of the presence or absence of mountains. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but you can pull up maps of fault lines pretty easily. Compare them to where earthquakes are reported. Now, compare both of those to Google Earth. See a trend? That being said, the Greeks proposed the idea that earthquakes happen because the continents ride on tops of bodies of water, allowing for the shaking. Still wrong, but closer to right than suggesting mountains can prevent an earthquake. Once again, time to abandon your holy book, put on a lab coat, and become a literate atheist. The Quran speaks about biology, that we have created every living creature from water, every living thing, in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, 
verse number 30. Quran mentioned this 1400 years ago. Well, all living things contain varying amounts of water, and I'm sure the first person to see someone drink, another person take a piss, and a third bleed figured out that we're pretty intricately involved with water. Plants that aren't watered die. Plants that are cut produce sap. Not rocket science, again. But it's also worse than wrong to suggest we're just made of water. We're made of far, far, far more than just H2O. If your book said, And out of form, chains of acid bound up within a cell smaller than the eye trap all living things. You might have had a convert just then. Fortunately for me, it doesn't. It says some vague crap about how everything ma is made out of water. A pretty easy conclusion to draw, and one that's not completely correct to begin with. Also... <laughs> the Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus postulated that since all living things needed water to live, all of life most likely originated from water. So, yeah, have I mentioned you need to do more background research on these claims yet? The Quran speaks about zoology, about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter 27, verse 17 to 18. About the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 66, 68, 69. This is exactly what I was talking about with the gish galloping. So, we're going to go back through one at a time. I'm sorry, people, I should really just dismiss it as a claim made without evidence, since he's not even reading the section he thinks is impressive. We've got one claim with three examples, going in the order he presented them. Spiders, from chapter 29, verse 41. The likeness of those who take to themselves protectors other than God is that of the spider. It builds a house, but the most fragile of houses is the spider's house. If only they do. Right, um... Are we supposed to honestly be surprised that someone could work out that spiders weave webs and some spiders create nests or burrows? Nope! While I'm not going to say Muhammad is stupid for this one, I am going to say that you haven't read the Quran if you're going to cite this as an amazing insight. Also, pound for pound in terms of tensile strength and the like, spider webs are fucking strong, so calling them the most fragile of houses is a lie. Next up, ants in chapter 27, verses 17 and 18. To the service of Solomon were mobilized his troops of sprites and men and birds, all held in strict order, until when they came upon the Valley of Ants, and Ant said, Oh, Ants, go into your nests, lest Solomon and his troops crush you without noticing! Now, before you get excited and argue that he's talking about pheromone trails and the like, the Ant is speaking the words as is made clear in the next few verses since Solomon heard the ant. He goes on to talk to the birds, who are part of his army alongside the sprites. This sounds more like fantasy than science, mate. And before people think I'm hiding something, here are the next three verses. He smiled and laughed at her words and said, My lord, direct me to be thankful for the blessings you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and to do good works that please you, and admit me by your grace into the company of your virtuous servants. Then he inspected the birds and said, Why do I not see the hopo? Or is he among the absentees? I will punish him most severely or slay him unless he gives me a valid excuse. Yup. Solomon is threatening to execute a bird if he doesn't have an excuse for not being amongst the ordered ranks of war birds accompanying his army. I never knew that Dr. Doolittle was a Quran fan fiction. So that leaves the bees. He skips a verse in his references, but I'm going to read all four of them as a group just to avoid losing any context. Chapter 16 Verses 66 through 69. And there is a lesson for you in cattle. We give you a drink from their bellies, from between waste and blood, pure milk refreshing to the drinkers. And from the fruits of date palms and grapevines, you derive sugar and wholesome food. In this is a sign for people who understand. And your God inspired the bee, set up hives in the mountains and in the trees and in what they construct. 
Then eat of all the fruits and go along the pathways of your Lord with precision. From their bellies emerges a fluid of diverse colors, containing healing for people who reflect. So the first verse is about cattle, not bees. Don't know what that's about. And in all cases, this is in no way information that wasn't already common knowledge where it's even right. No points for your god. If this is the best you have, your Quran is rather scientifically worthless. Speaking of common knowledge, while plenty of other cultures had domesticated bees, I only get to credit the Greeks. Aristotle wrote extensively on the behavior and keeping of bees, so there you go. In general, the Greeks studied and documented most living things, including spiders, ants, and bees, as demonstrated by the Aristotle example. As an aside, it doesn't count as a Greek, but the early Christian theologian, Origen, discusses both ants and bees as communicating and having societies in his work against Celsus. So, they got it better than you did, mate, and he didn't waste effort crediting to God the observations of man. No wonder you didn't read these out. One of them belongs in The Lord of the Rings, and the other two are such common knowledge it almost wasn't worth looking for Greeks in either of them. Can we agree that you'll pace yourself and explain your claim next time? The Quran speaks about embryology in Surah Alaq chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2. We have created the human being from Alaqa, a leech-like substance, which we have come to recently. The Quran speaks about embryological stages in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. Okay, on the leech thing, I'm just going to drop this bit from logic in here. I rather like how he handles the matter. But yes, folks, here it is, the moment you've all been waiting for, the single most compelling scientific miracle claim in all of Islam, at least that I've ever heard. And boy oh boy does that ever say a lot about the state of Islamic apologetics. Okay, first thing, usually Islamic apologists will compare the human embryo at around Carnegie stage 11 to a leech. Here's a common picture they use for the comparison. Now, the first thing that jumps out to me here is that they don't really look alike even superficially. This drawing is supposed to make them look alike, and they still don't look alike. But the only thing I can see that's supposed to be similar is that they're both longer than they are wide and kind of wormy. But if we look at actual photos, like these, yikes, oh yeah, retroactive trigger warning, leech. <laughs> anyway, that's pretty damning, in my opinion. You can't look at those and mistake them for each other in any way at all. And don't even get me started on the detailed anatomical comparison, oh boy. Yeah, this is pretty stupid. No sane person would accept this comparison unless they were high on something and feeling way too generous with their generosity. Check out the full video, Joe Muslim, Abandon All Reason, linked in the description when you finished mine. As for this whole nonsense about embryological stages, from chapter 23, verses 12 through 14, we created man from an extract of clay. Wrong? Do I have to explain what's wrong with comparing an extract of clay to the embryological cycle? This suggests to me that the following verses are related to the formation of Adam, not embryology. Then we made him a seed in a secure repository. Not wrong, but not exactly unknown to anyone who is paying attention to the pee-pee in the hoo-ha. Then we developed the seed into a clot. Just wrong. Again, you're never a blood clot during developmental stages. Then we developed the clot into a lump. Excluding the clot reference, vague enough it can't be wrong, but also useless, so it's not right either. Then we developed the lump into bones, then we clothed the bones with flesh. Wrong! Again, flesh begins to differentiate in the embryo before bones, but for the most part, flesh and bone can be said to develop at the same time. It just depends on where you draw the line between protostructures and the final form. If we're talking about fully formed bone, then yes, flesh comes first, completely wrong in every way. Last two sentences. Then we produce it into another creature, most blessed is God, the best of creators. Except he keeps being just plain wrong in his own fallible book, so I wouldn't call him best. Runner-up for worst, maybe. And all of this is for something that the Greek Hippocrates roughly described about a thousand years earlier. I mean, they weren't completely right, but they were less wrong than the Quran. 
out of honesty, I have to admit I found this link through the same logic video used above before I could research this claim. Never reinvent the wheel. You can go on talking about the scientific points. There are more than a thousand verses in the Quran which speak about science. And if they're anything like the ones you've used in this video, your book is more ignorant than the Bible. Just saying. Just saying. After every scientific fact, you ask the question, who could have mentioned that in the Quran? The only reply the atheists can give you is the creator, the, the cherisher, the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. Well, in our little journey through your video, it seems like my initial claim was correct. It wasn't the creator. It was curious humans who worked shit out for themselves. We aren't as stupid as religious apologists make us seem to be. I've already addressed how your book is so often wrong, rather fallible as it were. What I think we should be focusing on now is how, when it wasn't wrong, the Greeks usually knew about it first. And let's recall, I was limiting myself to just their culture. While doing the research for this video, I stumbled across examples of Hebrew, Egyptian, Chinese, Roman, Indian, and more writing about all of these subjects. Not every one of them in every culture, but if you looked at them as a body, the Arabs were in contact with cultures that knew every single one of these facts about the world long before the birth of Muhammad. There is absolutely no reason to conclude that the Quran required special knowledge to explain its contents. It's just a mishmash of Near East myths with some beliefs about the world that predate its authorship, just like the Christian New Testament and Hebrew texts from which it took much of its own content. Sorry, dude, but you genuinely... Sorry, dude, but if you genuinely believe that your holy book is either always right or completely wrong, then the Quran proves atheism. Join us on the dark side. We have bacon. And if you've enjoyed this inanity, consider subscribing for more of the same. Let me know down in the comments what you think of the whole mess, and if I missed any Greeks who deserve credit for outsmarting Muhammad before he was born. If you aren't a fan of money, feel free to give it to me over on Patreon. I've set up rewards that are worth it to you without compromising my own principles. I'm an Dragon, and I hope you've all had fun. Good night.